So we're going to be talking about um, financial, financial statements, right? How you get investors to invest, right? You need solid financials. You need solid uh, financial models and, you know, certain things that you should be thinking about that you may not be thinking about now. Everybody in the, in the, in the restaurant industry concentrates on the P&L. That's all I hear, P&L, P&L, P&L. But I'm going to give you one little tidbit and hate to break it to you moment that if your balance sheet, which most of you do not look at, is incorrect, that means your P&L is incorrect, okay? So a lot of times people shove things on the balance sheet because they don't know what to do with them and um, really it should hit your P&L. So when you are pitching or you know, showing financials or you're showing um, you know, in very, very P&L focus, which, uh, which obviously is extremely important, um, if your balance sheet is not right, then you know, what you're presenting may not be right. Or when you're determining bonuses, right? I have had these situations where they're determining bonuses for their people, uh, for your people, um, or you know, just you know, metrics, looking at different metrics, and then all of a sudden you're like, wait a second. You know, something's not right here because your balance sheet was wrong. So, um, but, uh, you know, on the P&L, you know, what, what do we look at the P&L? The P&L, there's also, in the restaurant industry, there's, a, like, we feel there's really a standardized P&L that you should be looking at. You know, so you really get an understanding of your costs, right? So everybody knows, you know, you have your net sales. Everybody knows you have your prime costs, which are your cost of goods and your, and your, uh, your labor costs, right? So... You know, people focus on that, and that's really super important. There are very few things that you could control on your P&L. There's probably about five things you could control that you have, you know, really actionable, controllable things to do on your P&L. But, you know, that, that's, you know, how we like to structure it. And then you have, obviously, you have your P&L. You have marketing, repairs and maintenance, utilities, restaurant supplies, and controllables. Does anybody in the room know what controllables are? Are you familiar with the word controllables? Okay, controllables, sort of like what, what the word sounds like, you know, sort of what you could control. Those are really, are all expenses, and I'll give you third-party delivery, maybe credit card commissions, all things that, it, it's really a function of your, your revenue. I mean, at, at the end of the day, you have G&A that are very fixed in nature that really that you can't do much about. When I say, what can we control, like the five items on the P&L that I could control, right? I could control somewhat sales, Right? I could do things to move that needle. I could cost a good sold. I could do actionable items to move, that, to move those needles, either you know, up or down. Um, I could labor. Labor, while it's you know, super hard, but right, we could do things. We could do things with scheduling. We could do things with you know, labor rates. We could do things with um, you know, just you know, days of operation, you know, hours of operations, things of that nature. So there's definitely things that we could do to control that. Right? The rent. Uh, we can't control, right? <laughs> Rent, we can't. That's one of the things we can't control. Pay, supplies. Supplies. I call that, that's the big area that drives me crazy with companies because your people that work for you, they just, oh, I could save a penny. I'm going to order supplies for like the next year. Or things. That's what I call cash on the shelf, right? That's, that's we, we bought a whole bu bunch of stuff. We're not going to, we have no immediate use for it right now. And I'm tying up, I just tied up a bunch of cash that I, I really could be using towards other things, right? Or like I bought, all the, I bought all these supplies and now we're thinking about changing our logo or we're thinking about changing something or pivoting in our business. We, we thought we were gonna, all of a sudden everybody wants to come into our restaurant and we're doing less third party delivery and I have all these packaging supplies that maybe I won't be using or, or you know, something better will come out. So those are the, those are the things on the P&L. So I think everybody is really, pretty well versed on their P&L, you know, because um, that's what you sort of all hone in, in on in. But I will tell you that if you as operators are depending on your bookkeepers, accountants, whomever is doing your, your maintaining your books and records, if you are counting on your P&L on a monthly basis to run your business, you are 100% doing it wrong. I will tell you that right now, because that is history. When you get that monthly P and L, that's like a week to ten days, maybe even two weeks after, you know, after the month is over. Right? And what happened, right? So if you had a labor problem in week one, you, you're going to continue. If you're not looking at other reports, if you're not looking at labor reports, if you're not looking at sales reports, if you're not, if you have no sort of management reports that you are looking at, and you are giving your team to look at, 
right? Because you're expecting them to reach certain metrics and things of that nature. If you're not giving them that information, there is no way anybody's going to know that they had a labor problem five or six weeks ago that will continue to move on. So it's really important outside of your P&L, which is really important. It's history. Balance sheets are history. P&Ls are history. Cash flows, old cash flows are history. Forward cash flows are obviously our projections. And that's what you want to concentrate on. So, I mean, one takeaway just on all financial statements, while they're super, super important to your business, it's the management reports that really move the needle they're on really making, really making real time, right, valuable, educated decision making. That's what, you, that's, that's what I tell all my clients. Like, you need to look at the management reports. That's what, because you have expectations. I think we talked about cost of goods sold yesterday. We talked about, you know, percentages and things of that nature. You know, where we could, where we could move the needle, where we could bring more cash, right? Cash is queen, where we could bring more cash to the bottom line. And those are the things, those actually, if you don't give your team, right, if you say, I want a 27% gross, you know, gross, uh, gross margin or, you know, cost of goods. Like, what does that even mean? <laughs> like, right, 20, you're just throwing 27% per, you know, percent at that. You know, what is it historically? What do we need to change? Do we need to change the plate size? Do we need to think about new vendors? Do we, you know, we talked about, I think, um, you know, talked yesterday about, like, farm to table, you know, do we need to go to more certain items, you know, by, you know, using U.S. foods as opposed to using, you know, the farmer, you know, down, you know, down the road. So those are the things that, again, you should, you know, be honing in on. You know, and why do we, you know, why we look at these numbers, you know, the importance of understanding inventory management, um, you know, again, inventory management is super important. You know, food inventory, that, that turns. It's really quick. It's really, it should turn. And if, and if it's not, if you are not constantly buying, that means you're just, you know, you're not doing well with your buying. And that's something, if you're having a lot of waste, you're not paying attention to, um, again, what's going on in a day-to-day -day basis. Because you guys, you know, more often than not, you're depending upon the concept. You're really ordering on a very regular basis. You know, the, the you know the, the beverage side of it, whether you have alcohol, obviously that's We're a little different, that. right? But that's really inventory management is super important. You know, having keeping accurate inventories and also keeping everybody honest with respect to the inventories. Really understanding, you know, specifically if you have a concept that has a you know a, a heavy beverage program, and or you have a bar, you know, a very big happy hour bar scene. You know, making sure that you know, the bartender is not giving away too many, you know, buybacks, that's not even a thing anymore. You know, get, you know doing things of that nature. That, that's what, why inventory management is, is so important, understanding that and under, getting an understanding of why these percentages might be going up or down, right? Where we have, you know, we did really well in one month and then we did really horrible, you know, in the next, I, I went the wrong way. And we did really horrible in the next month. Why, why did that happen? You know, did we not count our inventory? Did we not do a month-end inventory? Did we have a whole bunch of purchases in the, you know, at the end of the month? And then, of course, we didn't do our ending inventory, and our in, oh, yeah, ending yeah, inventory, which is an asset, is not on our balance sheet. Our balance sheet is wrong. Our P&L is wrong. So that's certain things to look at. Um, right, percentage. One big thing is a lot of this industry is we talk about percentages. Percentages, percentages, percentages. It's, it's talked about all the time, right? But at the end of the day, percentages don't pay the rent, right? Raise your hand if you'd rather, and if you were here last year, because I, I think I gave this example, do not raise your hand. <laughs> you know the answer. Would you rather sell chicken at 20% or sell steak at 35% as, 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 a mar as a cost? Who would rather sell chicken? As a, would you rather, in your restaurant, sell chicken at a 20% cost or steak at a 35% cost? Who would want to sell chicken? Raise your hand. Who would want to sell steak? Steak people are right. right. Percentages don't pay the rent. How much do you charge for a, could you potentially charge for a steak? Way, way double, way, way, way more, right? I will, I will sacrifice margin every day of the week. If I owned a restaurant, I'd sell steak and scotch all day long, right? It's not hard to flip a steak. It's not hard to cook a steak. Doesn't need much, a good cut of meat, right? And to pour a scotch, not, to, not too bad. But that's what I would sell if I was opening my restaurant. Because that's what percentages don't pay the rent, cash does. Okay? Okay? So these are the things that we talked about. And you're going to get this slide, you know, things, things that you really need to look at, right? 
and you know how you can move the needle on that. And one thing I taught, I, I mentioned yesterday is about the restaurant industry concentrates. When we go over P and Ls, when I meet with management teams, everybody concentrates on what they did wrong, yeah. right? Like areas of improvement, yeah. but nobody really looks to what we did right, right? So we might have four different stores, right? Same concept, four different locations, same concept. We have one concept that is, re you know, really doing well. Um, you know, labor rates are great. We have another concept, labor rates are terrible, right? Why? You know, what? why aren't we not, you know, we're, we're constantly saying, all right, we need to tweak this, we need to tweak this, and the ones that are bad. Like, what are we doing right, right? So I always say, let's look to what we're doing right first. Right? And it could be we had no staff. Literally, I worked. <laughs> like, you know, I, I, I did everything. The labor is, that's not attainable, right? And, and then sometimes that's the truth. But then there's always a happy medium between the two. So I always say that, don't always concentrate on doing what, what's wrong, what you've done, you know, where areas of improvement, like look where you've done really well and try to, and try to mimic that if you can, if possible, you know. And it's also leveraging when you look at P&L side by side or you look at concepts, I always say benchmark against yourselves because when you're looking at your concepts and you're looking at your different locations, you know, why there are differentiations, why there are variances between the locations and what this manager is doing right, because a lot of times it's, it's, it all comes down to the manager. The, the, the most vulnerable part, you know, managers like make or break a lot in your restaurant, a lot in your restaurant. So, and as far as and costs and labor and retention and things of that nature. And labor also, you also have to look at another thing with labor, and I know I'm starting to talk a little operational, but it, it does feed into the, the financials, is retention, right? This is an industry with a lot of turnover, a lot of turnover. And so, the ancillary costs associated with lack of retention is really high, right? There's a lot of ancillary costs. It's not just, it's retraining people. It's loss of institutional knowledge. It's, you know, it's an overall disruption. It's an overall distraction with your people. So those are the things that, you know, everything that happens operationally is represented here. And my biggest, I, I say it all the time, the numbers don't lie. Right, so the numbers do not lie. Somebody could tell you we're doing great, we're operating great. If I don't see bottom line profitability, you're not operating great. Okay. Last year, there was some chatter about corporate overhead. Everybody really wanted me to talk about corporate overhead. We ran out of time. We didn't talk about it. So what is, you know, actually corporate overhead? You know, specifically when you have, when you have one location, you're opening up, a, like corporate overhead is not, really a big, a big thing. You know, you have one location, everybody's concentrating on that one location. When you do start to expand, and that sort of dovetails on like enti entity structure that they talked about yesterday with, you know, every store is in its own LLC and it folds up to a holding company and that's where you might have the management team. You know, overall, what is corporate overhead? You're gonna get, you're gonna get this, um, you're, you're gonna get the slides. Just, yeah, you can take a picture, but you're gonna get the slides. Um, so corporate overhead is, think of it as all expenses that for the greater good of the company, right, of the brand. Corporate expenses, because when people evaluate your company, right, when they evaluate your company, they are they're looking at first store level, four, four wall, four wall unit economics. Because and if you have corporate overhead, which you all do, but when you have a couple of stores and you might have an outside investor coming in to look in, when you have corporate overhead, that corporate overhead, you could double in size in the number of stores. That corporate overhead is not gonna double, right? So everybody looks at for a wall because this becomes very manageable, right? It always looks upside down. Corporate overhead, when you're an emerging brand, I run emerging brands, I, see, I could see corporate overhead 17, 18, 20, 20, 22%. Like really high corporate overhead as a percentage of sales. Because what these companies are doing is they're building their benches, right? They're building the infrastructure to really ramp up their number of stores. So it's like I equate it also to a commissary. When you have a commissary, right, you need to feed that commissary. Commissaries are super expensive. They are cash cows because they need to be fed. But once you start feeding that commissary, right, all those advantages of having a commissary like show up, they show up on the P&Ls at the stores 
or they show up at your, e, you know, your CPG, your e-commerce, or whatever, you know, whatever you're doing with that, with that commissary. Same thing as corporate overhead. Corporate overhead is the same concept. As you grow your brand, that percentage becomes less and less as, as a percentage of your overall sales. But it also, it also, it's the value of it gets greater and greater. Right? And it's, uh, there's always the question of when we bring on these people. Right? And you know, I think yesterday we talked about like, investments in yourself. Like, you have to look at it as another investment in the business, no different than your mixer or your, your oven or your ice cream machine or your, you know, whatever, whatever equipment. And it's your people. It's part of, like, like I said yesterday, human capital is you know, your big, one of your biggest assets of your business. You can't survive without it. So, so corporate overhead, you know, typical costs you know, are guaranteed payments or salaries to everybody sitting in this room. Um, director of operations, regional, you know, it's labor costs. Direct, regional managers, your finance team, your marketing team, things of that, you know, th those, those type of people. You know, also, you know, we ask, like, people ask me, like, what other costs, like R&D costs, like when you're expanding the brand, right? You're expa the expansion of the brand. You know, you might, do, you might have multiple concepts, you know, within your overall ecosystem. It might not just be the one brand that's, you know, um, you know, with 10 locations. It could be a lot of different concepts. You know, Michael has many concepts, right? And so there's R&D associated with that. So that usually goes because those are costs. There's also costs that are, you know, somewhat fixed in nature where there isn't an associated, like, sale associated, right? There isn't associated revenue. It's an invest. It's all the investments that you're making. And so when you're being evaluated, whether it, you're evaluating yourselves, right, your team is evaluating the P&Ls, or you're being evaluated by a third party, it's really important to bifurcate these expenses because, again, they are really, they're just, they're just negative to the bottom, you know, overall they're negative to the bottom line, right? So what else do we have? We have, right, brand research and development costs, brand level marketing, accounting and finance, computer software, insurance, corporate, you know, occupancy, travel, meals and entertainment, you know, <laughs> charitable donations, right? Sometimes, you know, below the line, we put interest, interest expense and depreciation and amortization. Depreci obviously, interest expense is uh, cash. Um, depreciation and amortization is, you know, you're depreciating, amortizing, you know, whatever those hard costs that, that you had. So that's, you know, corporate overhead. And the next question is, people ask me, is how do we allocate that, right? What is the methodology? I actually do with very large companies. We, I do very large projects on corporate allocation. Specifically when there's different ownership, right? They have me come in and evaluate the corporate overhead and how they should be allocating amongst maybe different brands. It could be one, you know, where they have different ownership and they want to make sure that they're, what I talked yesterday about, you know, stealing from Peter to pay Paul, fiduciary responsibilities, that when they have situations where they have different ownership for maybe, you know, they might have a couple of different brands, but they have still the same team that are servicing those brands how do they fairly allocate those expenses amongst their brands, right? And so there's, you know, there's different ways. There's a direct allocation, which, you know, monthly basis based on actual costs, right? And so typically what you do, no different than you do in your restaurants, you do a budget. So you do a budget, what you think, you know what these costs, these costs are more fixed in nature, so it's easier to sort of budget them out. And then what you would do is you would, you know, again, you would, and, you know, these are, the, these are the overhead costs incurred by the management team. The management fee, you know, would charge the operating units. They could be based on revenues. If there's, you could get really exact and say, you know, this is the problem child. And the problem child has the most, can't afford the allocation, right? They're the, they're the ones that can't afford the allocation, the corporate allocation, but they require the most attention from the corporate team. It's just the nature of the beast. And it should be allocated. It should, it should be allocated. People say they're never going to pay it back, but it, they, they need that representation. They, you need to understand because when you're evaluating, and that's what I see, I see a shift away from that one. They can't afford to pay it, so we're not going to allocate anything towards them. But what I see happening is that when they're evaluating that store, whether you should keep it open or not, everyone is forgetting these costs. Right? Now, you're not losing $5,000 a month. You're losing $10,000 a month because you have people who are working on a different P&L to support that store, and, you're not, and it's not being recognized on that P&L. 
And so that's something, lesson, you know, sort of lessons learned. I see that all the time where people are not recognizing those costs because they think that specific store can't afford it, right? There's accounting and there's things to be that we won't get into. It's too complex, but um, you know, to kind of take care of the fact that it's never that it may never get paid back. Um, then there's like an indirect allocation where you're just doing, you know, a monthly. It's just a monthly management fee, and a lot of times. When people ask me what should the management fee is, I always say do a budget. But there's also like some management companies are not there only to, not only there to um, you know the, these you know the people that are, you know all these costs that I that I went through, but they're there to it's sort of where you are going. Sorry, jump ahead. It's where you might be getting paid, right? Where certain ownership might be getting paid, they might be sitting in that management company. I said guaranteed payments, but it's like where your sort of some a profit allocation goes to you. So, so that might be we'd have a management fee of five percent, and then maybe we have a profit allocation that's built into that management fee of another five percent to pay you, to pay you know everybody in this room, or to pay you know ownership. Um, so that's that's something again, you know, when we talk about building you into the model, building everybody into the model. We talk heavily about what, you know, how is ownership, you know, we talked about distributions and like how are they going to be fairly compensated, right? And it's also sharing sort of the, the wealth of, you know, the brand, you know, getting all the revenue from the brands up to the management company to support. And again, making sure that it is fair. It is definitely fair. Every brand should 100% bear the cost of whatever cost goes into that corporate overhead. Does anything, anybody have specific questions that they want to talk about corporate overhead? Do they have? What size do you think a company needs to be before they have a corporate overhead? Like, what would be if you're one location, it doesn't make sense. If you're two, it's two, really yeah, you know, it, it matters how you're operating. You know, depending upon how you're operating, do you have, like, is there, does, is there really a need? Like, do you, you don't have a regional manager. You know, you may have one manager that's servicing both, right? A general manager that's servicing both. Is that really corporate overhead? That like, oh, let me just do a split, you know? Like, let me allocate, do a, do a split. Um, you know, I think once you get to three, three or four, maybe three to five, is where you really start incurring those costs, those really brand-related costs that you're, that you're definitely thinking about. Um, you know, having you know more of a structured corporate allocation. A lot of times, people th put things in like pre-opening expenses, right? When it's very specific, and that's also really important to understand when something's very specific to a location. It could be rent, right? It could be utilities. It could be insurance on that very specific to that one location, because that's really important information for you as well, right? When you're opening up a store, it's not like what. You know, and we talked about working capital. It's not just the hard cost. You know, everyone fixates on the build out, right? It, what it costs to the build out, but it's all the costs, right? Those soft costs that we call those pre-opening costs, right? Think about certain delays you might have. Now, Michael, you know, with the way he does structure his leases with about not being charged rent, but there's ma there are many people I'm sure in this room that you know may have done a deal with a, with a landlord. Started paying rent way too early, right? Because things didn't open, you know, things didn't go as planned. Volatility, they didn't, you know, whatever that, you know, whatever was happening, and we're paying rent to this landlord, and right with no associated costs, you know, no associated revenue associated with it. So, that's that's pre-opening. So there's a fine line between like pre-opening and, um, you know, and really corporate overhead. Michael, when did you start? Really, like. Look, so, thinking about corporate overhead. So we started with our very first butcher and bee. I built in a two and a half percent fee that eventually could get allocated. It went to me initially for my salary, but eventually it could get allocated to a management company. Right. That's, one, of, one of the things I, I was going to talk about to raise my hand and ask you, like, what advice do you have for people on their first or second store in terms of building into the OA to set this up? Like, yeah, people I. People need to do that off the start to say we may, and there may be this fee. Yeah, I think, you know, again, because usually when people have their first location, more often than not, they don't set up a management company, right? That they'll, they'll wait to set up a management company. So I don't think really one size fits all. I think it's really how you're structuring. I, I typically encourage my clients 
once they hit like three locations to start thinking about a management company because you're really going to start spreading resources at that point. So I, I think that is the time. I mean, look, if you want to do it beforehand, I don't. I never discourage setting up, you know, things the way where you think, you know, go big or go home, right? I think I'm going to have 10 locations, 20 locations, 30 locations. So I'm going to set this up now. I'm going to set, you know, I'm going to set this up now for that, right? And it matters also how how quickly you're ramping up. You know, I, I have a client that's that's doing. They're just starting their concept. They're building five restaurants this year, and they haven't. They're op they opened up one so far. And they have five five LOIs and spending a lot of money, so. Yeah, I was ask, go, gonna ask something similar to what Michael asked because, in relation to Stephen's comment yesterday of not having built uh, having built himself into the model in a way that made it very hard for, him, for to move to a management company and replace himself, right? So, doing something like what Michael described of setting aside two point five percent or whatever with the first location. Does that help replace I, yourself? I typically, when we do financial modeling and we're ramping up, I usually built in corporate overhead in sort of the, the later year, maybe year three, year two or three, depending upon how they're ramping up, right? How a company might be ramping up. Um, because again, if you have one location, you know, is it really corporate overhead? It's really not. Because you're really just focusing on that one, mm -hmm. that one restaurant. Everything relates to that one restaurant. Now, you could be in a situation, to your point, when is the right time, like my client who is now, they're just doing a new brand. So they're pretty well established in the hospitality industry. Everybody knows these people and just won't mention them. But so what they're, you know, they set up corporate overhead right away because they're ramping up to build five stores in a six month period of time, right? So they know that. The order is placed. Order is placed. Um, but it's growing so much, and I feel like we're really, we're, it's challenging to scale it up because it's still unit-based. But we had a conversation with our partners, because we're a partnership, and this was a decision we made to not do like a, a corporate structure like this, just because we weren't really planning on doing a third. But now it feels like catering should be its own unit. That's very typical. That's very typical. Now, Where, uh, yeah. I'm I'm a little handicapped in trying to um, make that happen easily because of our partnerships. I didn't think about it in Unit 1. Our partnership structure is not prohibitive, but it would require getting more Get, Getting, having a, having a conversation, right. Well, when a, when a, a re, I, I typically say when there is a revenue stream that becomes that really significant in your overall landscape of your business, then more often that, that is not, you know, the core Restaurant, so events is events catering is a big one. Typically, I do recommend setting up a separate company because how do you determine, you know, which entity sometimes gets that catering gig, right? It's sometimes it's the luck of the draw, and if you have different investors in it, well, like why is Michael, you know, getting the advantage of that catering gig when I could be, you know, just because it just happens, you know, and so so yeah, that's that's when, when it becomes significant, it's something you need to think about. And it's worth the conversation, for sure. It's worth some, any anything else on corporate overhead. What do you think? Of? Um, are there situations where it happens inversely, where maybe you're at one location, you're seeing it's working, there is revenue, and maybe in order to take yourself to two or three or whatever you know the growing pattern will be, you kind of need this type of infrastructure. Because someone like me, I'm a chef, I don't know what I'm doing, so that is where a business like mine might be lacking. Um, so is there... Well, so you mean bifurcating just, some of those costs, bifurcating, <coughs> thinking you're going to, some of those costs out, whether it be like R&D for the new concepts, things that, yeah, it, it could be a situation. Like I said, if you believe you're going to ramp up, you know, quite, you know, quickly, but, but if you're doing, you know, you're opening up one and then maybe two, there is, you could also present it on your P&L in a manner. So typically what we do is we say, you know, revenue, cost of, you know, cost of goods, labor, you know, it could be marketing, it could be occupancy, you know, occupancy costs, 
um, G&A controllables, and then we have underneath, we have corporate overhead. So there's like, so we really delineate between what is unit level economics and what is corporate overhead, you know, the corporate overhead part. So when you're, like that's really, you know, super easy to do, to, you know, to do that. Yeah, people, uh, the mistakes I've seen, so, and, and I'm sure Sarah's going to, I don't know if Sarah's in the room. Sarah might be talking about this later. But uh, two areas that people definitely hire too late is HR, right? HR when they become a certain size, and if they don't have a really, they're, they're not really concentrating on the, the, you know, the value of what HR, an HR director might bring to the table, or using potentially a company that's, you know, they're, they're trying to do it themselves. That's just a nightmare. That's a lawsuit waiting to happen. And it's also, it affects, it puts in the right, the right training, the right policies and procedures, the right, you know, the, it helps with retention. It's an, it's an investment. So that's a, I see that lot, like very late in the game. Um, finance is always looked at as a cost center and never a revenue, like, a, a, or an EBITDA generator, right? Um, always. And that's, I always say, people say, when should I do this higher? Six months to a year before you think you need it, right? It needs to be looked as an investment because the right person, and Emily could speak to this because she's been in that role, the right person will work with the operations team, right, to point out certain things and to help move that needle and to bring value, right, and to set you up for success, the right person. I'm saying the right person. Not every person, the right person. So those are, I would say, the two areas. You know, a director of operations, that is the one position people bring on too soon. <laughs> I see that all the time. They bring it on too soon because they're lacking really good managers. So they compensate for, good ma for bad managers with a director of operations, thinking a director of operations is going to solve all the problems, make everybody better. Right, so that's a that's a position I think people bring on slightly too early in in the process, in in the process for sure. And when you when you're hiring these areas, does it does it matter if you're using it externally or if they're internal? Because right now we're using um, we're using empowered hospitality, and we're using um, an external finance company. But is there a point in time where you need to bring them in house, or does it really matter? I definitely think there's always a time to bring. Now, accounting, like outsourcing, I'm a huge proponent. I don't care if you're three units or I have clients that are one unit outsource. I have clients that own 175 Taco Bells and outsource, okay? So like the day-to-day, -day, I'm a huge proponent of outsourcing. The question is becomes when do you need that person internally to deal with that outsource company, to be the liaison between your operations team and that outsource company. That's, that's where, you know, that's the part where people are like usually unsure, right? Because what happens is the burden becomes on all of you. You become that liaison more often than not. And no disrespect, you're all, you're all like B-sided, right? You're all type B, right? You're all creative, right? You're all unsure, you know, people, that don't, you're here because you, you don't love the finance side of it, right? <laughs> And, um, and you want to learn more and you want to love, you know, you want to become a Steven where you want to learn, lo love to learn the math, right? And so this is typically not your strong point, being the finance. And like, it's not, you're not giving value to your company, right? At the end of the day, your, your time should be spent doing other things, right? When you could afford to, you know, at the beginning, bootstrap, you know, somebody brought up or bootstrap. Like, yeah, you are, you know, you wear many, many hats. But there is a time, yes, there is a time. And it's, you know, sometimes it's very, you could afford it a little bit sooner than others because of the, the revenue per store, right? You're generating more revenues than, than, you know, like a one, you know, I have a one unit restaurant that does, no joke, $36 million a year. <laughs> Get your head around those numbers, right? Okay, which it could be, that could be, you know, 10 units. It could be 15 units of you know a fast casual so you know like so it's there's always you know there's there's always always a balance you know as far as HR again that's you know it's more of a people 
It's more of a, a, a you know, a, as you grow, all your areas of risk get exponentially bigger. So, I think. I have a question, and it's okay if we have to push this to office hours, but um, what advice might you give to operators who are scared to pass off financial controls because of not wanting to be that distant from the ins and outs of it? You always need to touch the paper. Yeah. Always. Always. If you're afraid to, if you're scared I mean, I to delegate, you to do what you're, saying, you're, 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 then, then get out of the business. You're never going to, you're never going to be, pro, you're never going to be truly, like, reach your full potential. I really believe that. People that are so, so, so ingrained and not, you know, you didn't get into this business to be an accountant, to just do financials. You got in this business because you brought things to the table that you believed you brought things to the table that could, you know, grow a hospitality brand, right? Whether it be with your culinary talent, whether it be with your people talent, whatever it is. But if you grow and never delegate, it doesn't matter what industry you are in. If you grow and never, like, you always need to touch the paper. When a, an, an owner says to me that they were unaware of their financial situation, I never feel bad for them. Shame? No, I don't. I'm like, shame on you. You always touch the paper. You always touch the paper. You just touch it. You're just not in the minutia. You should never be. A, you, you should get to a point where you don't have to be in the minutia, you know, of the day to, you know, of the day to day, because you're taking time away, right, from like what you're really good at. You know, it's just like I always say, chefs. You know, your operators. There's always the, the people in your operations team. They always should be involved in, from a financial perspective, because like I said, whatever they do lands up here, ends up on the P&L, right? I'm not sure, but there was a P&L here before. That's where it all ends up, right? So it's a representation of their work, right, from a financial perspective. It's a representation of their work. So um, I, I would say, you know, get over yourself. And, and it's been burned on both financial operations, and it's been very painful and expensive. But again, like another. Yes, but because you can't ever stop touching the paper. Yeah. That's my point. My point is you can't. OK. All right, so another area that everybody asked about that I promised Emily and team and, and, um, and Ann and everybody that I do is cash flows, right? Statement of cash flows. People, that's another thing. You don't look at the balance sheet. You don't look at your statement of cash flows, right? How many people in this room look at a statement of cash flow on a weekly basis? Okay, couple, all right. Uh, monthly basis, okay, ever. <laughs> right, there's some people that never, you know, never look at it, right? So there's a couple of ways, you know, to, to, there's so cash flows, right? So what, what, are, what are, what's a statement of cash flow, right? At the end of the day, what's a statement of cash flow, right? So we have operate, it's, it's bifurcated into three sections. It's operating activities, investing activities, and financing activities. They're sort of self-explanatory, right? Operating activities are really just, you know, your ins and outs of your operations, right? It could be your accounts payable. It could be your AR. It, it could be your accrued expenses, you know, changes in that. It's really the operations generated from the core business activities, your day-to-day -day business activities. That's what operation, you know, so it's almost like looking at when we say free cash flow, you know, what is free cash flow before you service debt, before you pay income taxes and things of that nature, before you make a distribution to your investors? That's what that is. It's like the definition of sort of free cash flow within the company. It includes corporate overhead, includes everything within the business, but it is the day to day. It's a representation of the day to day, right? Um, there's also, when you look at your PL, there's non cash items on your PL, right? Depreciation, amortization, that's a non cash item. Right? It started out as cash when you purchased that piece of equipment, but it never went onto your balance. It never went onto your P&L. It hit your balance sheet, right? So, but then it eventually hits your P&L through depreciation and amortization based upon how the useful life, right? Equipment could be five years. It could be ten years. Your lease, your leasehold improvements. Those could be that could be you know fifteen years. The life of your lease, ten years, five years, fifteen, whatever the life of your lease is. It could also be amortization, pre-opening expenses. Some people, you know, from a tax, because a lot of you are probably like your tax and your, and your books are, probably, are, are pretty similar in nature. Um, and so you're a cool bit, you know, hopefully, I hope 
Everybody's accrual base in here, by the way. Your financials, your tax returns, all should be accrual base. If anybody's doing cash basis, you call your accountants right after this and say, I want to change to accrual. <laughs> because a cash basis is not a true representation of what your, your business is doing, and we'll go over that after. And it's also, from a tax perspective, it's, does, it's not the same benefit. Because you get pretty much all your revenue up front, except if you're doing catering, right, or events, right? And sometimes, if you're a cruel, ba if you're a cruel basis, you get to defer, not pay tax on that money that's coming in, gift cards. You know, there's, there's special rules around that, right? But, and expenses, you know, you get 30 days, right? You'll get 30 days sometimes. Sometimes, you know, if, if you're paying your accountant, it could be 90 days. You know, it could be whatever. Um, but those are the things that, so again, tax efficient to be more tax efficient. This is an industry that should be accrual based. And as some management companies are cash basis for, for certain reasons, but for restaurants, they should be accrual based. And accrual based is a better representation of, of your business, right? You know, what are investing, right? Investing are what long term, you know, long term excluding asset, excluding inventory. Inventory is an investment in your business, but it turns really quick. It's part of your operations. But like your leaseholds, that's an investment, right? That's an investing. It's an investment in the future of your operations. Your you know, furniture and fixtures and things of equipment of that nature, right? It's, a long, it's typically long term. And then the selling, if you sold it, right? If you sold a piece of equipment you know, or if you, um, you know, sold your lease or things of that nature, it would be in investing. And then financing, right? Sources of cash to fund a business. Right, so that could be a capital contribution, it could be a distribution, as well. It could be financing. It could be a, a payment of. Uh, it could be debt coming in, right? You proceeds from debt. It could be repayment of debt. So those are the things. Any any questions on this? I think it's pretty straightforward. You can see over there. Okay. Wait. No. Okay. So these are just you know things that I talked to. These are the types of cash flows, and again, you have this all, you know, on of the, of the different things, you know, because a lot of people, a lot of people concentrate on free cash flow. Or we said, remember, I said yesterday, the cash you have in the bank is not the cash you have, right? Because everybody looks to the cash they have in their bank, right? So there's certain cash that you collect that is not yours, right? What's one of the biggest ones? Sales tax, right? Sales tax. Who's your the no, the most important vendor that you have? To the two most important vendors. Whatever state you're in, their Department of Revenue, right? The federal government for all your payroll, all your payroll liabilities, right? And then your landlord. I know, I know people hate their landlords, but your landlord is like the second. He even comes before I. I said pay your landlord before, before you pay me, right? Gift cards. Gift cards too, right? That's another one where that's great. We got all the cash. It's Christmas time. We are cash flush, right? Well, guess what? Right? You're going to have a bunch of sales where later on you're not going to get any cash. So just be wary of that. Right? That's not your ca that it is your cash, but and I'm not saying you don't use that cash, but just know you have a liability and you're going to have sales and you're going to incur expenses that you're not going to have any revenue associated with. You're not going to have any cash associated with that because you already received the cash. So I see this is a big, you know, when they say what do operators do wrong? They get in all this, all these these gift cards, right? And they immediately spend. You know, they spend. They don't really look to the future because they don't have proper cash flows. That's why, and they don't look at their balance sheet. That's Is another it still thing. Worth doing gift cards? A hundred. Oh, yes. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Gift cards all day long. You just have to be. <laughs> you just have to because you know. Think about the people who don't. You know, get a gift card and never and never redeem it. Forty percent. Yeah. yeah. I mean, technically, you have to sheet it to the state. You know, that's the right thing to do, but you know, we won't go into that. That's a whole other legal and, and, and accounting thing that we won't go into. But yes, I am a huge believer in uh, you know, gift cards. Gift cards are great. Um, you know, some of the investing, like we talked about, liquor license, investments, security deposits, you know, loans you know, to related parties, things of that nature. Um, that's also a balance sheet item. You know, related parties, I talked about that yesterday, stealing from Peter to pay Paul. Right, big, um, you know, where, where the money starts, you know, the cash starts shifting around. And you have different investors. Not good, right? Because now I have, a, I have this huge receivable from this one company that's doing poorly. And like, I'm making money here. And then my investor comes back and says, We made a million dollars. Like, you're going to distribute a million dollars, right? 
oh, well, no, I gave, uh, I gave you know, $300,000 to my other restaurant that, oh, by the way, you don't own. You don't own. You know, that, never, that never works out well. So that's uh, you know, something on the investing side. Financing, we, we went through all those different you know, financing things. And again, you're getting all this. OK. So there's a couple of ways, methods of calculating cash flow. There's the easy, right, direct, in and out, cash in and out. Just think about your, your cash basis, right? Like, this is the money that came in. This is the money that came out, right? Very, very easy, simple. A lot of people look at it this way. You know, then there's the indirect cash flow method, right? And then you start out with net income, and then you go through those operating activities, fi investing and financing activities. And that gives you a true understanding of where your cash is going. Because when, you know, when Stephen said, hey, I made all this money, and, and, and the, um, his accountant said, that's good for you, but you have no cash. <laughs> What do you mean we have no cash? Why don't we have cash, right? Well, your cash flow tells you where all that cash went. That's, that's the purpose of the cash flow, to tell you where all that cash went, right? OK. Could everybody see this? It was hard to make this, <laughs> right? Can we make this bigger on the? Not on the PowerPoint, no. OK. All right. <laughs> so I got to go on this side, because I have to actually look at this. All right, so this is. I did a very extreme example here because I wanted you to understand where your cash is potentially going and why you think you have cash when you maybe don't, right? So here is, think of this as, this is restaurant number two. And I'll, you'll, you'll understand why I say this is restaurant number two. Separate company, restaurant number two, it's a separate company. Everybody can't wait till you open, right? Everybody, oh. Is this okay. better? Yeah. Oh, no, but then I can't. Oh, no, no, this is great. This is great, yes. And just tell me when you Oh, no, open. now I can't see the, the, no, make it smaller. Sorry. Yeah. All right, we can move over. Uh, no, go back. Go back to the original. All right. Because I, I want to show it side by side. OK. OK, there. sorry about that. OK. So now here's, here's restaurant two, right? Here's year one. Okay, here's year one. Okay, we have the working cap, we have about $100,000 in the bank, right? We have some prepaid expenses. We have property and equipment. We invested a million dollars in property and equipment. That's everything, that's our build out, right? Security deposits. I have inventory of $10,000. Um, I have security deposits. I pay my landlord $50,000. Intangibles, these are like my pre opening expense, let's just say pre opening expenses, you know, intangibles. I finance this part with capital, $600,000 of capital, right? I got a note, I did, I did some debt, right? $500,000 of debt, right? I have some payables that I owe to everybody, you know, as I was building out. I have some trade debt. Everybody was so stoked that I was opening number two, right? And, and, and it's an event space. They paid me $350,000 because they wanted to have their event within the next year in my space. So right off the bat, because it's my second or third location, whatever it is, everybody was super jazzed and I got all these deposits. Or I got you know, the same as gift cards. Right? I got $350,000 of cash. Score, right? I have a lot of cash. Right? I've got you know, notes right here. And then because I got that 350, I wanted to be so nice to my investors. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to pay you some of your cash right up front. Right? We got all this cash in. I'm going to be so nice to you, and I'm going to pay you, right, $235,000, OK, right off the bat. All right, so that's my opening, let's just say my ending p &L. Now I'm open, right? Now I'm open. Look how much I made. I made a million bucks. I made a million bucks in one year, right? I have cash flush. I made a million bucks, right? How much cash do I have? <laughs> $75,000. <laughs> my cash actually went down. I made a million bucks and my cash went down. Why did my cash go down? Right? Why did my cash do that? Because $100,000 of that is in, like, I had events and they owed me money, right? The people owed me money, $100,000. <coughs> so I have a receivable. Now, again, it's short term. It's, it's, it's not liquid yet. It, we expect it to turn into cash. But again, it's not cash. Right? It's not cash. OK? I have some prepaid expenses, right? I have expenses that I prepaid for. It could be insurance. It could be whatever. You know, I paid, I paid a vendor in advance, right? Small amount, not a big deal, 
right? Inventory. I'm, I'm the hottest ticket in town. I gotta increase my inventory. Everybody wants to come to me. I gotta make sure that I could service everybody. So I increased my inventory, right? From 10,000 to 80 to 74,000. Increased my inventory. So again, it's an investment, right? But it's not cash. It's investment, it's not cash, okay? Property and equipment, I added a little bit to it. I wanted, I'm doing so well. I want to expand. I, I know I could expand the business. So I'm going to add a little bit more furniture, you know, whatever it could be. More tables. I added more tables. I added, you know, whatever. I added a, a great current, you know, the current. I added a great uh, espresso machine, whatever it might be. Security deposits. My, my, landlord, uh, my landlord said, you, you think you're, you're using some more space, you know? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to, like, I, I want more of a security deposit. Or, or, I, or I did a deposit on equipment for next year or whatever, my security deposit. So here's an asset, but I'm not getting this cash back anytime soon, right? $50,000 more, right? Do from related party, right? Well, this is the hottest ticket in town. Now people are not going to my first or second location as much. They're kind of sucking wind a little bit. I'll give them 100 grand to tide them over. Right. I don't know when they're going to pay it back, but I'll give them 100 grand to tie them over. Right? So there goes $100,000 of my million. Okay? Again, notes payable, right? accrued expenses. That, that actually, I'm conserving cash. My accrued, my accrued expenses and accounts payable went up. So again, I have expenses, but I haven't doled out the cash yet because you know what? I'm waiting for my $100,000 to come in from my events. So I'm going to hold off my trade, my trade debt right, to all my vendors because I want the $100,000 to come in to satisfy this, right? Taxes payable, right? What's that? Ta taxes payable, right? So that's my, you know, my sales tax or whatever. Again, it's a liability, current liability. That money, I might have gotten money in, but again, it's going out, right? Here's my debt payments. I have a really, I didn't go to the SBA or have a seven year or a 10 year, whatever. I had debt, I had paid over five years or whatever. So here's $100,000, right, of that went out to service my debt, to service my debt. So the moral of the story here, and here's where it's all represented, right, on the cash flow, telling me exactly, exactly, oh, I put in here, so a million dollars, I forgot about this, I'm sorry. Like, I got, because I, this was during COVID, I got a PPP loan, right? So that, that million, that, that $500,000 loan, right, is I'm getting income, like it's just, you know, it's forgiven. So it's not really, I didn't make a million, a million dollars. So my investor comes in, my investor comes in and says, you made a million dollars, like, where's, you know, show me the money. I have no money, I only have 75. You know, but I did, I gave you 485, right? I gave you not 485, I gave you $250,000, right? I gave you, you um, $250,000, like where's the 750? So my point here is why this is so important, cash flows are so important, because it really shows you where the money is. Where is the money going? Your money is not always your money. Um, so that's really important. So I mean, I, I don't think a lot, I mean, that used to be, I'll just look at my bank account. Like, don't, don't look at your bank account. Never look at your bank. Obviously, look at your bank account for fraud <laughs> and things of that nature. But like that number is just a number on that day. It doesn't demonstrate any of the, the future obligations that you have. That number, when you look at it, the more often than not, it's always going to be lower, right? It doesn't represent any of the checks you might have written that just haven't been cashed, right? That's another outstanding check. That's why we do bank reconciliations. So that's just really important. Your balance sheet, I can't stress enough how important your balance sheet, this is a representation at that point in time of what your assets and liabilities, where they lie, right? So you might really concentrate on this, but here, right, these are all things. I have $200,000 that I have to satisfy within the next year. It could be within the next month that I have to satisfy these liabilities. And guess what? I only have $75,000 of cash at the end of the year. So if I had to pay these on January 1st, and I don't collect my receivables, I'm gonna be in trouble, right? Right, I'm gonna to have to have a conversation. I might have to go back to these investors and say, by the way, I know I just gave you $250,000. Can you just shoot me $50,000 of that back? So that's why cash flows, again, are so important. Any questions? 
on cash flows. Anyway, I'm gonna get her. I'm gonna get her first. That's a receivable. Exactly. Some of them 30 days, some 14 days, you know, yep. some one week. And how does that, um, how should that be represented on the balance sheet? And then having it a significant, uh, that being, you know, quite a considerable part of your revenue, should you be very concerned about that because of the delay? Um, right, the timing. How long it takes. The timing of it, right. So exactly. I could talk all day long about third party delivery and like all that. But you know that's that's a receivable. It's money that's owed to you, right? And so when that's a, a a large part of your business, right? So it's really important you from managing your cash flow. What's super important is to understand, you know, your commitments to your vendors, obviously, and what you could afford or cannot afford based upon the timing of when your cash comes in, right? So if you're waiting 30 days, the likelihood is your vendors are probably going to be waiting 30 days to to get paid, right? And so it's managing that cash flow. Now, obviously, this keeps on, you know, it's rolling in. It's rolling, you know, so you keep on having cash rolling in from 30 days prior and things of that nature. So if you've always been in a really good cadence, you still might be able to pay your vendors and say net 10, net 15 to maybe get a discount. You know, I always say to my clients who are really good payers, it drives me insane. For whatever reason in the restaurant industry, and I think it's becoming because of COVID and, and um, just, you know, the volatility of the way the economy has been, you know, asking these like a U.S. food for or you know these vendors for a discount. Hey, I'll pay you in ten days, but give me five percent. Like nobody ever. I'm like, why, why aren't you asking for that? Right? They'll be like super excited <laughs> to like get in the restaurant industry something in ten days. Right? So those are. So you have to really understand sort of your cash management. Yes, yes, you have to understand your ins and outs of cash flow and how they're coming in. I always, really important on your, and whether you want to put it on, when you're doing financial modeling or you're doing a budget, putting in an ff &E reserve, right? That's my rainy day, right? That's like I didn't expect something to break, and it broke, and all of a sudden I have a $50,000 CapEx expense that I never thought was going to happen. So I, I always encourage my clients to put in a 3%, that's right, 3%. It may never come to fruition, right? 3% CapEx. We, I always put that into a financial model. Yes, cash is queen, right? Cash is queen, like we said before, right? I'll get $50. I may get $75 for that steak in cash, right? I'm going to get $20 for that chicken. It's a $50, right? 25 It could be 55 It doesn't, yeah. So margins are, don't get me wrong, margins are important, right? Margins are important, and, and I highly recommend when you're looking at your just menu, right? Because when you create a menu in a perfect world, you're supposed to cost out the menu, right? You're supposed to cost it out, right? And that's how you determine, right, your, what your overall cost is going to be, right, to, to achieve a certain margin. So you have a theoretical cost, right? You have a theoretical margin. What actually happens is going to definitely be different. I'll tell you that much, right? <laughs> it's going to be different, right? Because they're not, your people in the back are not, you know, doing a quarter teaspoon of this and a quarter, you know, they're just throwing stuff in, right? So with respect to that, you know, that's why it's really important. The margins are important because you're building your plan on a certain, right? You're building your model. You're building your concept, your expectation or your budgets that you're hitting certain margins, right? That you're hitting certain margins. So you have that. If you're selling steak, you have that margin in there, right? Like, my P&L is going to look really different than your P&L, right? But, it, but my top-line revenue is going to be higher than your top-line revenue, 
right? Because I'm just more inexpensive. My average check is gonna be way higher than your average check, right? So margin specifically, if you have just a very consistent average check, margins are super important, right? And understanding, and not all, like, you know, everyone says I'm just gonna raise prices because that's always, you know, again, cash is queen, right? How do I fix my problem? I bring in more revenue because revenue is typically always the answer, right? More revenue, more revenue. But sometimes the market, you know, you, you, you outpace the market, right? And your, your prices are too high and they don't see the value proposition. And they stop and then your traffic goes down, so raising prices. So that's why it's, it's super important to understand what's on your menu, what's understanding the margins, right? Because my most popular item, I could have a burger that people don't care if it's $13 or $15. They're still gonna buy that burger, right? They are, they're still gonna buy that burger because it's their favorite thing on the menu and they're gonna still buy it. So I might just raise it on the burger, right? And not raise somewhere else, right? So those are the things, that's why financials, you know, the information that's contained in a P&L, super important because it gives you the overall like picture at the end of that month or the end of that year or that period, but it doesn't give you the minutia, some of the minutia that you need to actually make those decisions on how you are going to drive your business on a go forward basis if you're not getting the results that you're expecting to get, right? Because revenue, I'll tell you one thing, revenue hides every single problem, right? Everybody discovered what, what, what everybody discovered that there weren't as good of operators as they thought they were, right? But on the flip side, everybody came who survived the pandemic and came out better operators because of it, because they had less dollars to deal with. They had to figure out a way to make their companies run with less dollars coming in. I know you had a question. I just wanted to confirm that you're recommending we look at this with our accountant every week. What? Not, maybe not with your account. You, they should be supplying. You should be having a, a week. You should be getting weekly cash forecasts. You should be having six, months, six weeks out. Okay. Six weeks out cash flow. Six weeks out. And if there's a deviation in them, right, because there's going to be some deviations, it's like, why is there a deviation? To understand why there's a deviation. Because it could be because you start out with your net income. So if your net income is off, it's because potentially, you know, your margins are off, you're not being efficient in your labor, you're not being efficient in your purchasing. You know, there could be a whole host. Bad inventory management, a whole host of things. I think I'm running out of time, right? Anne, am I running out of time? Five minutes. Okay, five minutes. Okay. So these are just, this is more not for, you know, you're not going to like really concentrate on financial ratios that much, right? But these are obviously profitability. That's, you're going to concentrate on that the most, right? That conveys how well a company can generate profit from its operations. You have liquidity, measures a company's ability to pay off its short term debts. Like I said before, I have $75,000 cash. I have current liabilities of 200. That could be a problem, right? Um, activity determines the efficiency of the companies in utilizing its assets to generate cash and revenue, right? That's what, the, that's what um, activity and solvency really compares a company's debt levels with its assets to see if it really could continue to go. Can they service their debt that they currently have? And I brought this up yesterday when you're doing debt to equity. What's really important also in your cash flow models is that you obviously, it's servicing of your debt. It's not just the interest expense, it's the principal too. It's servicing, being able to have on your cash flow, your debt service, it's really important. So these, I'm, I don't have to go over, these are financial ratios, and these are things that a bank might consider, an investor might consider, when they're evaluating their business, when they're, a banker or an underwriter wants to give you a loan, they're gonna look at these ratios, right? An investor might look at profitability ratios, a banker's gonna look at solvency ratio, ratios, right, and liquidity ratios. Those are the things that they might be looking at where, you know, working capital. I can't stress the importance of working capital and understanding that within your business because, and how much working capital you need. You need to understand, all as operators, as owners, you need to understand how much money you have to have in the coffers if something goes wrong, right? If something goes wrong, how much do we have to work in capital? Fixed costs that we have absolutely no, that are definitely gonna come. We have to keep, to keep the lights on, right? So what are the costs to keep the lights on that we have to have a reserve set aside? And I also, a fixed asset, you know, like a repairs and maintenance or FF&E reserve, 
I always put that in, like I said, because that's what, you, you just never know when something is, is going to break. And that's why I say repairs and maintenance. Also, people don't think that they could control that. That's another thing. That's another item on your P&L you can control because you need to make sure <laughs> that the people that work for you are pretending it's their house they're taking care of, right? They properly clean that fryer. Right? They properly do the maintenance of everywhere. Because if you have people that are not pretending it's their own house working for you, that repairs and maintenance, that's supposed to be 1% to 1.5% of your revenue is going to skyrocket to 3% for sure. And you can't afford that 1.5% differential. That's it. Any, you have a question? Uh, yeah, you mentioned third party, and I would love for you to uh, perhaps give a word of caution to Stephanie to the group. On, in the past couple of years, we've seen companies like DoorDash and Toast offer loans to restaurants, um, small loans, typically between five and fifteen thousand or twenty thousand dollars, and they get the money and then they pay it back over time based on like performance on third party or every credit card transaction through Toast or something yep. like that. What's your opinion on those kinds of loans? So, who's been around long enough to remember the American Express loans? Right, everybody's shaking their head. You know, really expensive. That's ex very expensive debt, right? And it's also, they take your cash right up front. You have like no, so there's no really, right? So they're very, they they get paid back in a very short period of time, right? You have like no control. There's no negotiating it. It's just like all of a sudden, oh, there's my cash. It's gone. Oh, there it goes, right? That's what it is. So I don't, you know, again, when it's expensive, I know people like when they're desperate times, desperate measures, but they really have to look at what the per se long term effect of that is. Are they gonna, is that short term fix gonna really put them you know, in a position from a long term perspective? A, you know, a, a better position from a long term perspective? So when you are in that situation where you, for many reasons, need more cash, but don't want to you know, put yourself in a worse situation, like you know, you're operating, you need to keep the lights on, and you have you know, orders, caterings that are coming in, but you don't have the cash. So basically you need cash. And, you know, to, to find out how much you actually really need. And is it a good time? Because it's also like, in order to grow, you're in a position where it's sort of like, a, how do you say, sink or sail? Sink or swim. Sink or swim. And, uh, you know, so it's like, how can you, if you're like, well, I have this opportunity for an investor, but right now we're not, we're in a cash crunch. You know what I mean? So I, I think a lot of companies, you know, when people ask me, they grow a little bit too fast, right? They don't perfect what they currently have. Now, again, there's been a lot of, you know, there's been a lot of situations, you know, the past couple of years have not been normal times and really, you know, successful brands have had a, had a dip, you know. You know, it was definitely, you know, ebbs and flows is definitely an ebb, you know, in the past couple of years. But I do believe that companies, you know, when there's a lot of buzz about a company, right, a brand, right, and then you get a lot, you know, oh, you need to open up another one, you need to open up another one. I don't, I, I think one of the biggest mistakes of people in your position, and probably most of this room, is like the growth, they get, when people get very hyped about you, right, and you, and you start listening to the hype, right, and you really haven't, and you, and oh yeah, I could open up another store, oh, like I'll get, I'll get TI to do this, and like everybody is really loving me, right, I'm, I'm feeling it, right, I'm feeling it, but like you don't really, you're feeling it, but like you really haven't perfected your, your current operations. You really are not that profitable yet. You really haven't honed in. So again, everything gets ex exponentially worse, right? You open up that second or third and thinking that it's like all gonna work, but a lot of times it doesn't, it doesn't. So again, you know, that whole expansion, like, oh, we have an opportunity to expand, right? You know, you have to look at it, you know, like sometimes I look at it as like short-term pain for long-term gain. That pain, like saying no to expansion is not the worst thing in the world. It just may not be the right time for you. Perfecting, having five stores, unprofitable stores, yay for you. I have five stores, I make no money. Oh, but I had like, I could have had two stores and really honed in on these two stores and been really profitable and made a lot more money. Top line revenue is only good as bottom line profitability. 
right? So, I mean, you get in situations where you might need cash, like quick cash, because like, oh, this bit of cash is going to really get me over the hump. I won't go back to your bank where you have your cash management. That $15,000, right, that you might get from a DoorDash, like, you can easily get that from, from your bank at the local branch level, right? They'll give you 50, right, at the local branch level that, that does your cash management and sees it coming in and out, right? Sees the cash coming in and out. They'll, they'll do that any day of the week, right, over, like, you know, doing these expensive loans. I, people get in situations. I get it. It's, it's, it's never 30, 30, 30. So that's, throw that out the door. That's not, it's never should be that way. That you should never look. Your concept, it's, in, now, there are industry benchmarks. So there's always like, oh, if you have this concept, it could, like if you're selling pizza, right, your cost of goods are gonna be in the low 20s, right? They're gonna be in the low 20s because flour, you know, eggs at one point, yeah, that's hard, you know, whatever. But like most of the stuff that goes in there, really cheap, right, uh, you know, for the most part. Right? You're gonna have you're gonna have a vegan concept, right? Could be your cogs are gonna be higher than that. They could be, you know, shy of thirty, right? Your costs and again it's it's understanding your costs. So like while there are benchmarks for everything, there's labor benchmarks, like I have every industry benchmark and in, you know, like in my head in, you know, I see we represent six hundred restaurant groups, right? I have an insane amount of data. I live and breathe this every day, right? So I know what these these ranges should be, right? But you really have to hone in on like what your concept is, and you know where within the range there is no one size fits all, and and specifically now, when you throw in third party delivery, right, that changes your labor model drastically. If it becomes to to her point, if it's really a big part of your business, right. So those traditional what front of the house and back of the house are going to be, your back of the house might be the same because it's still a cover, it's still an order, right? So it's, it doesn't matter whether they're taking it out or, or they're eating in, but, but your front of the house might look differently. So again, you might think you're doing real, you're like, wait a second, I'm doing really well in my labor. I'm within industry standard, but like how come I'm not making money? Because your labor is like industry standard with not delivery, with not that third party delivery. So your margins are coming out of the third party delivery commissions or something like that. So I think we should save for office hours. Yeah. So yeah, we'll save the rest of the questions for office hours. Great. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. Appreciate it.